a little bit of it. <coughs> we give God the glory for yet another opportunity to sit at his feet and to come your way again with the word of God, trusting that he will again speak. I was so blessed by last week's um, broadcast. You know, the need for me to know my relationship with God. He's my God. And uh, he's the only one who demands and deserves my worship. My Lord, from whom I take instructions. My King, under whose sovereignty I live. <laughs> and all these positions come along with obligations, you know, and uh, trusting the Holy Spirit to help us, right? <laughs> he will, he will. Shall we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we just come before your throne of grace. This day again, you have made it so beautiful, kept us alive by grace. We come in the uh, we have only one request. What do you want us to do? How do you want us to live, to please you, to bring out the honor, the glory, and the power that you made us to give to you according to your word in Revelations 4.11. So in all humility, we cry out again, Lord, speak to us in the language we understand. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dear beloved, we continue our conversation on consecration. And it's like, you know, as usual, the Lord is just throwing, you know, uh, bits and pieces of his plan, his vision, his word, you know, at me. You know, wherever you turn, there's something waiting for you just to remind you that this is the way I want you to live. It's not just about sharing it for others. <laughs> it's meant for you. Let me share some of the things you know, he's been sharing with me. I mean, today, those of you who use Bible Gateway, the verse for today is uh, 1 Peter 1, 15 to 16. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy. Because I am holy. You got, you got it, right? Okay. Then on Monday, um, for my quiet time, with Spurgeon's um, Faith Checkbook. Just just go to Google and, and look for it. Spurgeon's um, Faith check, Checkbook is so amazing. Every day has a reading that will simply blow your mind and really help you on this straight path that the Lord is asking us to walk. Narrow though, but exciting. It's only you and the Lord can walk at breast. Nobody else. <laughs> Amen. So um, this was taken from Matthew 8, uh, 5, 9, 5, 8. Sorry, Matthew 5, 8. So blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I just, no, just read... Well, the explanation is quite interesting. Purity, even purity of heart, is the main thing to be aimed at. We need to be made clean within through the Spirit and the Word. So here, um, he's showing us, remember, we did the steps to purity or consecration. And it's by the Holy Spirit and by the Word of God. So God is saying, be holy. And then he deploys one way or the other his spirit and also the word who is a son to help in doing that. Or not to help you means that you are holding part of it. Of course, your part is your willingness or submission, your yielding. But over and over again, the whole honors as it were rests on God to make sure that it happens. And all we have to do is to agree that we are ready for it to happen in our lives. Hallelujah. We're talking about consecration, right? Mm -hmm. So our only part is really yielding. How much does that cost? Nothing. <laughs> yes, it will cost us our life. It will cost us our time. It will cost us our emotions, our desires, everything. Nothing. Very expensive. But it gives grace 
for every situation. Hallelujah. Amen. So we need to be made clean without, within, through the Spirit and the Word. And then we shall be clean without, that is outside, by consecration and obedience. So here, yeah, we are being told God's part, as it were, and our part. You know, um, consecration, desire to be consecrated, desire to be holy, and also our obedience. Yes, Lord. <laughs> yes, Lord. Whatever he tells us. There's a close connection between the affections and the understanding. If we love evil, we cannot understand that which is good. If the heart is foul, the eye will be dim. How can those men see a holy God who love unholy things? That is, if we love unholy things, there's no way we can see the holy God because our eyes will be so dim, even if he's standing by us. You know, and which he is because he has promised to be with us always. We will not see him, right? We will not see him. Because really, if we really believe that he is with us always, it will detect how we live. We can't hide anything from him. There's no way he sits upon the circles of the earth. Everything is open and there's post before him with whom we have to deal with. All right. So let's bear that in mind that we can't hide anything. And don't dare. Think that you can commit whatever iniquity you're committing and then come back and apologize when you know exactly what you're doing. He gives grace. He will speak. He will prompt. He will warn. Let's heed those warnings because he will give grace to say no to sin. Hallelujah. The victory, the victory, the gift and the honor and the glory that goes to him when he gives us grace to overcome a temptation or a sin. Amen. Amen. Let's go for that. Amen. What a privilege it is to see God here. A glimpse of him is heaven below. In Christ Jesus, the pure in heart, behold the Father. All right. We see him, his truth, his love, his purpose, his sovereignty, his covenant character. Yea, we see himself in Christ. But this is only apprehended as sin is kept out of the heart. He will not code well. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Sit side by side when sin is in charge. And that is the reason why he tells us, you know, not to um, walk with uh, the wicked not to stand uh, with sinners and not to sit with mockers. A very wonderful graduation there, right? He wants us not to do it because it will not be helpful for us. He wants to have continuous fellowship with us. And anything, you remember, I, 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 this is just coming to my mind, so I've not checked. You told the Israelites when you're going out to battle, take a digging implement. So that just in case you, you, you want to ease yourself, you will dig. And when you finish, you'll cover it. So that when I'm visiting your camp, I will not see anything nasty and turn back. All right. Today, he says he's with us always. He's not just coming to visit. He's with us always. And that is all the reason why we need the Lord's grace to be able to keep away from sin. We are talking about consecration the need for it, and one way or the other, the benefits. We want to see God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, um, only those who aim at godliness can cry, my eyes are ever towards the Lord. The desire of Moses, I beseech thee, show me thy glory, can only be fulfilled in us as we purify ourselves from all iniquity. We shall see him as he is, and everyone that hath this hope in him purifieth, purifieth himself. The enjoyment of present fellowship and the hope of the beatific vision are urgent motives for purity of heart and life. Lord, make us pure in heart 
that we may see thee. Amen. Let me read the last part. The enjoyment of present fellowship and the hope of the beautiful vision are urgent motives for purity of heart and life. So if you, you have no reason for keeping yourself pure, the fact that you want to have true fellowship with the Lord, you want to walk side by side with him, and the Father, you want to see him. All right. You know, seeing him here is that those moments when he makes himself so palpable, you know, so real. You, you, you've you experienced some times like that, right? You you don't know what's going on, but you have goose pimples all over your body. Some people smell a very nice aroma around them when the Lord visits. There are beautiful locations, right? the best occasions you can ever experience in life. And if you have not yet experienced it, as the Lord, I want to see you. There's only one condition, that you have had a good bath. <laughs> if it says we have had a bath already, so our feet, it's only our feet that need to be washed. Confessing of sin and asking the blood to wash you, to keep you pure. Asking the Holy Spirit to set sentry around you around your eyes, you don't watch what is evil, around your mouth, so you don't even you know, speak what is evil, around your ears, you don't listen to what is evil. <laughs> busy, busy. You see no evil, you hear no evil, you speak no evil. <laughs> Hallelujah. God gives grace. Amen. Amen. So that's the sharing from Spurgeon's uh, faith checkbook. So let's get back to Psalm 5. Oh my goodness, and I just want to emphasize again, if you don't have time, don't read through the Psalms. Don't just read it like a recitation, because every word, every gloss, every phrase has a meaning. David was not just, you know, singing. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit to say marvelous things. And it's only when you have time to dig through it, you realize that, oh, Ah, is that what it means? If you simply read through it, you miss all the nuggets. So again, um, we pick again from verse 1 and 2. Listen to my voice. We are reading some 5, please. Listen to my words, O Lord. Give heed to my sign and groaning. Hear the sound of my cry, my King. And my God, for to you do I pray. In the morning you hear my voice, O oh Lord. In the morning I prepare a prayer, a sacrifice for you, and watch and wait for you to speak to my heart. For you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, Neither would the evil man so much as dwell temporarily with you. Boasters can have no standing in your sight. You are above all evildoers. You will destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors and rejects the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But as for me, and I want you to just look at it again from verse 7 to 12. You know, as I hinted last week, he's you know, giving us the characteristics of three categories of people. Himself as a righteous person, David here, and then what the wicked, the description of the wicked, and what God would do to them, and also the righteous, or those who are living consecrated lives, who have a right standing with God, and how God deals with them. So just pay attention from verses 7 to 12. But as for me, I will enter your house through the abundance of your steadfast love and mercy. I will worship toward and at your holy temple in reverent fear and awe of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way level that is straight and straight before my face. For there is nothing trustworthy or steadfast or truthful in their talk. Their heart is destruction or a destructive chasm, 
a yawning gulf. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flutter and mix smooth with their tongue. Hold them guilty, O oh God. Let them fall by their own designs and counsels. Cast them out because of the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. But let all those who take refuge and put their trust in you rejoice. Let them ever sing and shout for joy, because you make a covering over them and defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you and be in high spirits. For you, Lord, will bless the uncompromisingly righteous, that is him who is upright and in right standing with you. As with a shield, you will surround him with goodwill, that is pleasure and favor. So here again, let me just remind you that we are looking at the prayer of a righteous man. Prayer of a consecrated person. And I'm sure you, you see that it is not, um, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. He's also putting in his parts what he is going to be doing for God. Very interesting. Because our prayer is just focused on the end and ourselves. But what God wants done, we often leave that out. We are talking about the prayer of a consecrated person. We want to look a bit more at um, a few of these verses. We will we, we'll concentrate again on verses 1 and 2 and move on to verses 3. Uh, verse 3, if the Lord gives us time. So in verses 1 and 2, David's faith and confidence in, in God as he presents his petition. You know, David expresses his faith and his confidence in God as he express uh, uh, presents his petitions deferring to God as the only one to whom he would present his petition all right and I want you to take um, um cognizance of, of that so he says let's let's go back to that verse one listen to my voice O Lord or listen to my words O Lord give heed to my sigh and groaning. Hear the sound of my cry, my king and my God, for to you do I pray. To you do I pray. Very important. That God would take notice, take care of her. You know, if we pray fervently and in faith, you know, uh, letting God know that he is the only object of our worship. Worship of course, includes petitioning, requesting, you know, pleading with him. It's all part of worship. Because you can't just go and talk. Why are you worshipping him? You're also worshipping him for what he will do for you, right? And it is okay. It is very much okay. You know, there are times when we go before the Lord that we don't say, Thou art holy, thou art king. We don't even thank him. We simply pour out. You know, I keep saying that when Peter was sinking on the on the river you know if you had been saying lord god I, no 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 it was lord save me and that was it so there are times like that okay but all we are saying is that we are letting god know he is the only object and i cannot um refrain from adding that often we say this and yet we have many other gods that we are looking at you know, oh, let's pray about the situation. And yet we know, that we have a telephone list of those we are going to call. Yes, we are asking that God will touch their hearts, but really, <laughs> they are stand by. <laughs> Recently, you know, I uh, did it to do, to do some payments and I looked at my account and there wasn't much in it. And it was creating a little problem for me. You know, then it came back again. Oh, who can we talk? And then the Lord just reminded me. I thought you told you told me that you'd be depending on me alone. It's not just to say that he will not want you to ask. There are times like that when you finish praying and then he will just drop somebody's name. That's different. But where you have your list before going to the Lord, that is where the problem is. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, you know, I got a mail today uh, saying that some of the bills, you know, the Lord has made provision for them. This is God for you, right? This is God for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
So it does not necessarily have to come through you. Amen. I think that's the little lesson the Lord is teaching me. You are not God, you know, so it might not necessarily have to. But as you just hand the matter into his hands, he may either use you by providing for you or you will have some other. He has many children, right? <laughs> we can use anybody to answer that call. So what he's saying is that focus on me. Let me be your object of worship. As you present that request to me, fix your gaze on me alone. And then if he whispers, talk to this person, then you do that. Is that too difficult? It is. It's very difficult not to have standby generators. <laughs> very, very, very difficult. <laughs> I don't know if you find it easy. I want to know your secret. Okay. So that God would take cognizance of our case the presentation we make of it and the request we make upon it as we pray. You know, so he's saying, give ye to my words. Give ye to my words. I have faith in you. You are the only one I'm looking up to, oh God. You know, though God is in heaven, he has an ear open to his people's prayers. How many times have you gone to the Lord and, um, oh, I do it often. I finish and I just pack all my requests and put it on my head again. And I leave because I say, well, I knew you would not do it anyway. I knew you cannot do it anyway. Oh, yes, you cannot. <laughs> it's not that he's not willing. No, he cannot. <laughs> because I've made small boxes which I put God. You know, so according to the weight of the problem, I size the problem and then I size the little box in which I put God. And I know that, no, this one, they can't handle it. This is my little, tiny, puny, sinful thoughts. But let me just pause to let you know that that God is big. <laughs> He's capable of doing everything. He owns the cattle upon the thousand hills. He owns the heaven, the heavens and the earth. There's absolutely nothing. I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything to hide from me? Is there anything to hide from me? I remember so well, I remember so well. This was in 1983, yeah, 83 or oh, 84. You know, when we needed to leave the premises where, you know, somebody had just given us a room in which we were living and we had to leave that place and we were, we were under pressure to leave. We didn't have the money to rent a place. We couldn't even go looking for a place. We didn't know what to do. And I remember that morning I had to go and pray with a lovely mother of mine. And as I was walking by the walls, by the wall to you know the, 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 the wall next to the house, you know, the Lord, I can I can I can show you that spot where the Lord spoke. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything to have for me? And lo and behold, that very day we got the news that there was some accommodation we had to i remember going to that place we didn't have enough money you know uh, the money we had could only take us halfway you know transportation wise and we had to stand somewhere for so long before we got a lift and a lift and a lift and a lift and finally we got to that place and I remember that day we, we couldn't have enough money to even eat. So because we had to save more than money for transportation, we got to the house and this lady was all over us, prepared a good breakfast for us. Oh my goodness, I can't. Brunch, it was really going to brunch. You know, it was quite a distance. Gave us good food to eat. And then, you know, by the end of the day, we had accommodation. A full three-bedroom house. It wasn't the, the, I mean, we were not looking at anything like that. And he said, you go, go and take it. And whenever you, you can afford to pay, then you pay. And I remember when we moved to this house, we didn't know where the money was going to come from. But we kept praying. And one morning we're praying, as we're praying, just like I'm saying, knowing, not knowing where to go. You know, having fixed our rear gaze on the Lord because we didn't we didn't really have anybody to go to. The Lord kept dropping names in our hearts. I remember one of the names was Reverend Bob Hoxin, then my uncle, then somebody else. We had never done, you know, gone asking this before for but how are we going to do it? We prayed for grace. 
And I remember when we went to Reverend Bob, he was so excited. It was as if, I mean, he had just seen God. He was so excited to help. And then we went to see my uncle. And he was also so, before long, the accommodation was paid for. I mean, the, the rent advance. Those days, it was, the money was so little. And yet, it was very big for us. And the Lord provided. Based on that word, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Let me encourage somebody. What are you going through? <laughs> They've given you some, some, uh, some things, right? <laughs> and it's just spelt your, your way out to heaven. And so what? <laughs> so what? What's going on? You've lost a loved one, right? And you don't know how the world is going to spin around this axis. It will spin. The sun will still rise up from where it's supposed to be rising up, and it will set where it's supposed to be set. All right. Since Jesus hasn't come yet, we don't know whether he's coming in the next moment, but this very moment in which you find yourself where we are still here on earth, I, I want to assure you God will take care of you. <laughs> oh, God will take care of you. You want to hear some of the testimonies? No, let's continue with our discussion. God will take care of you, okay? He's the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for him? Nothing. I'm telling you, nothing. Don't be afraid, okay? The Lord will take care of you. <laughs> are you a student? You're afraid of your exams? You're having panic attacks? Your supervisors are not being kind? Don't worry. Don't worry. The Lord has your, 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 your address, okay? He knows where you are. He knows you're down, sitting, and you're uprising. There's only one condition. Keep away from sin. Keep away from sin. Stay pure for the Lord. Tell the Lord you are for him. <laughs> he will give you the grace to, to have all the conditions necessary, if you want to call them that way, for his help. And you know the condition that we are helpless. <laughs> that is the only condition. That we are helpless and we are looking up to him. He'll come through for us. Financial difficulties. Oh, I don't have the money, but I don't worry. I don't want to worry. I don't worry. I just told you about worrying about some little money and how the Lord has graciously provided. Okay. He didn't come through me. He came through another source, but it's okay. He has taken care of the bill. So that is how we roll. He will not give you all the money for you to misuse, but when the need arises, he will drop it. What else? You are in an abusive marriage. Oh, hand over that husband, hand over the wife to the Lord. Do it. You, you, you don't, if somebody says, hey, you don't know my husband. I saw my husband. Nothing. Can, oh, yes, there's somebody sitting up there who can change it. <laughs> or change it. God, who made him or her, can change him in a twinkling of an eye. I don't care how wicked a person is. God is able. And then in our nations, we have all these difficulties going on. Elections are coming. They are, they are real stark dangers. They are stockpiling arms to kill themselves. It's a do or die election. And so what? As long as our knees are on the ground, as long as there are a few saints who will keep themselves pure and cry out to the Holy God, He will hear us. He's looking for one righteous man. Said, go through, go run through Jerusalem and find one person who has not defiled himself. And I will hear the cry of this nation. We are crying that you who are praying, you will meet that condition by grace. Amen. Yeah. So what the Lord is saying is that once we have made him our object of worship, presenting our request to him fervently and in faith, we can hope that he will hear us. You know, so he's saying, though God is in heaven, he has an ear open to his people's prayers. And it is not heavy that he cannot hear. Why? Because the sins of the consecrated man have been thoroughly confessed, repented of, forgiven, and removed. He approaches God then, in the confidence of there being no blockage or blockage. Amen. You know what Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand 
is not so short that it cannot save. Nor is he so impaired or dull that he cannot hear. But your wickedness has separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So, so long as there is no sin, there is no blockade between you and God, he says, I will hear you when you come. So the consecrated man goes with confidence. Amen. Men perhaps will not or cannot hear us. Yeah, our enemies are so haughty that they will not hear us, even if we are calling on them. They will not even pick the call. Our friends may be far away, so even though they really wish to help, they are not around. They wish to help, but they don't have what it takes. <laughs> uh, so, what you want to know, get, 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 you know what? <laughs> Hallelujah. They really wish to help, but they cannot. They don't have what it takes to help. But our God hasn't got any of the problems. We are talking about here. He will not, you know, men will not or cannot, but God wills and God can. <laughs> are you hearing me? God wills. The leper said, If thou wills, thou can make us clean. I will be made clean. I will be made clean. And instantly the leprosy left. Hallelujah. So David prays in confidence that God would take his prayers into his wise and compassionate consideration and will not slight it or turn it off with a cursory answer. For so he prays, consider my meditation, that is my lament, my groaning, my sighing, my complaint. Listen to my words. Give heed to my sighing and my groaning. You know, David's Prayers were not only words, but they were his meditation, groaning, sighing. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's so occupied, you know. Sometimes we, we pray so flippantly. We, we've even forgotten what we're praying about, you know, by the time we get up off, off our knees. It's not something we are deliberating. Yeah, there are certain topics that should so occupy us. For example, when we are interceding for the nation, you know, and we are interceding for the church. Let me just give these two as examples. There are, there are examples that should so occupy us. Or when you are interceding for a sick person, you know, a loved one who is who is not well, it should so occupy you. Intently, day and night, you are focused on that. You know, you are groaning, you are sighed over it. And the King James Version, you know, one of the versions as is the King James, puts it as what? My meditation. Meditation is chewing the cat, right? You are finished eating, you push the kid, you know, uh, some somewhere, and when everything is over, you bring it out in your relaxed at, you know, uh, moments and you chew it again, like the animal would do. Uh, a cow, especially in a sheep. Okay. So, David is saying, after I've been on my knees, and we'll, we'll see how many times David is going, so seven times in the day, morning, noon, and evening, you know, I'm coming before you at night, I'm coming to you, you know, all night and all that. You know, after that, after I've come before you, especially to commit this issue into your hands, the rest of the day, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about, I'm brooding over it. It's not that he's brooding about how impossible it is for God to answer, but he's brooding about the petition. He's presenting this continually. Lord, I've presented something before you. Lord, I've told you about this person. Lord, I've presented the church before you. Especially if you're interceding for the church. The Lord puts an intercession for the church and the nation in your hands. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. <laughs> there are nights that you, the whole night you cannot sleep. And times like that, you cannot even, you know, you don't even know, you can't pray, you know, the long prayer. All you, you do is just grow, groan before the Lord. Your thoughts are just going up and down and you are just groaning, you know, in your spirit before the Lord. Because there is a bed, there is a crisis, especially if there's supposed to be a crisis where the Lord wakes you up. You know, to, to just stand. I remember one time like that when there was one of these uh, party elections. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, the Lord just woke. And I could see that the whole nation was tense. I said, What is going on? 
What is going on, Lord? My goodness. And you know that the rest of the night, that is the end of your sleep. The Lord will keep you up. Because you need somebody to stand in the gap. Something is happening. So that is prayer for you. We are talking about the consecrated man. Prayer. Taking the whole of you. Depending on the gravity of the situation. And let me just add that you may get into this kind of position and depend, you know, go into all these uh, grave issues and you know put in all these agonies. And if the answer does not come the way you want it, you know, the Lord has a way of letting you know his direction. Okay. He, he takes care of your will. Okay. In that matter. Uh, so even if the issue does not go the way you want it, it will not be a frustration because he will, he will pick you out of it, you know. And uh, uh, one, one of the ways um, when you have agonized like that and maybe especially, I mean, let me put it that way, um, when maybe a loved one is very ill and uh, you, you, you're kind of petitioning for that person to live and stuff like that. And maybe I'm using that as an example. The person has to pass. It's as if God virtually comes to ask for your permission. <laughs> I don't know whether you've experienced that. He virtually comes to ask for your permission in some way, either in a dream or a vision or some way, the way you communicate with him, you know. He kind of comes to ask your permission and you have to kind of release. He brings you to that point of releasing I've, I've had this you know occurring you know sometimes at the best side of of loved ones where the lord brings you to that point of of releasing that person to go releasing that person to go i don't know how it happens you know but he kind of brings you prayer has a way of affecting you of changing everything about you all right so when we are praying it's not just because we want this or we want that one prayer has its work it's fine, beautiful work. And you have to pray to understand some of these issues. Sometimes the petition you have you have presented is not the, even the prayer. <laughs> the real prayer is going to come later as the Lord gets back to the table with you, you know, to discuss a few things. Prayer is the most exciting thing <laughs> that man can ever engage in. Sitting down with God, to communicate. Amen. Amen. So David was meditating upon his prayer. So in Psalm 19, verse 14, for example, we read, I mean, this is something that is very, a very popular, you know, quotation. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable, pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my firm, immovable rock and my redeemer. Hallelujah. You're petitioning. Lord, this is my prayer. I'm thinking about it. Let even my meditation over this prayer be acceptable. I'm praying, let it be acceptable. Let it be acceptable. Come through for me, Lord. Come through for me. Prayer, prayer is just occupied. And boy, he will, he will wake away. <laughs> Let's not be flippant at prayer. You know, it's like just catching a fish with the, with the rod. You just throw it, it in it. You may catch or you may not catch. If you don't take care, you only come out with canisters, empty cans. But the one who is fishing with the nets is on the sea all night. He's going right into the depths, throwing the nets and not giving up until he gets a catch. I don't know why I'm bringing this analogy. I don't even know where it's coming from. But there is prayer and there is prayer. <laughs> we are talking about the prayer of the consecrated person. All right. So let's not give up. Let's not be flippant. If you don't have time, don't pray. Because prayer must take time. And it's not just on your knees and prayer, but if, as it occupies you daily, you know, you can be going about your business, teaching, uh, whatever, but it is taking hold of you. And the answer will definitely come. That is a fervent prayer, right? <laughs> Effectual. And the other condition of a righteous man of his much. So this is expressive of the confidence David has exuded in God regarding his prayer. It is when we thus consider our prayers and then only 
that we may expect that God will consider them and take that to his heart, which comes from ours. You know, when we are putting in so much, you know, then God know, ah, this guy is serious. <laughs> Let me go. Let me go. Like the woman with the issue of blood, shoving, pushing, every people pushing him. You also find a way going under. I just want to touch the hem of your garment. And you got it. You got it. <laughs> Amen. That he will in due time return a gracious answer of peace. For so he prays. So he is praying with expectancy. We'll be looking at that in verse 3 in a little more. Praying with expectancy. So he says, hearken to the voice of my cry. Hear the sound. You know, I, I, it's, it's amazing how he calls it the voice. The sound is a voice of my cry. So a cry has a voice. You know, and everything has a voice. You know, the stone has a voice. Everything has a voice. Yes, we may look at that someday. But the cry here has a voice. So God, listen to the voice of my cry. It's not listen to my voice. No, the voice of my cry. The cry. You know, every, I don't know what, those of us who speak in tongues, how, you know, you get into certain areas of uh, special intercession and your tongue, the tongues change. I mean, it changes. And sometimes there are some of these tongues you will never speak them again. It's amazing how it happens. You know, so every cry perhaps has a different voice. Or when they say children, when they cry, I mean, there are various requests. Some, uh, I'm, I'm wet, I'm hungry, I, I'm irritated, you know, I want attention, you know, and people have been able to have the various kinds of cries. And here we are being told that the cry has a voice. I'm wondering what kind of voice is behind your cry. God. Amen. It can be a cry of arrogance, a cry of helplessness, a cry of humility, a cry of you know, submission, a cry of expectation. I'm just saying this, but I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking through me. Okay. And cry of God, I knew you could not do it anyway. Cry of unbelief. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I'm collecting my things and I'm going, I knew you would not be able to do it in me. Who is the next person to call? Yes, hello, can you help me? And we believe in that person when he says, come tomorrow. That person who can lose his breath in the next twinkling of an eye. We believe what he says more than this God who never dies. <laughs> we are amazing. Lord, I'm mercy. Lord, I'm mercy. Hear the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. So his prayer was a cry. It was a voice of his cry, which denotes fervency of affection and importunity of expression. And such effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man avail much and do wonders. The consecrated man prays with fervency and prays effectually. Therefore, he is certain that he will be heard. All right, he'll be heard. Yes, no, wait, silence. <laughs> Have you ever prayed in silence? He said nothing to you. Hmm. He said nothing. He said nothing, but because you are prayed, um, yes, he said nothing, but something else will be working for your good. Amen. All things work together for your good. You activate that at least. <laughs> Our communication with God in heaven in prayer must be intense. And we must live off our knees with no doubt that heaven has heard us. Whether we are praising, we are thanking, we are vowing, we are petitioning, we are re requesting, repenting, we are supplicating, no matter the kind of prayer we are offering. Our prayer must be intentional, intensive, fervent, with expectation. Duration, it could be a second. It could be a minute, 30 minutes, an hour, and more. The 
real thing is the vim behind it. Transparency behind it. The truth. I think it's the truth. The word is truth. The truth. The honesty. Integrity behind it. Amen. If we saw prayer in this in this light, it would be very easy for us, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let's look at verses uh, 2b to 3. You know, where David deploys four uh, tools of communication with God, you know, in his prayer. You know, four tools. I don't know if we'll be able to finish everything, but at least let's start. So he says, for to you do I pray. In the morning, and we are reading from 2b to 3. For to you do I pray. In the morning, you hear my voice, O Lord. In the morning, I prepare a prayer sacrifice for you and watch and wait for you to speak to my heart in the morning. Okay, so what is the first tool David is deploying here? He says, I will pray. <laughs> for to you, do I pray? I will pray. He did not say, I will worry. I will be anxious. I will fret. I will pray. And half the time, instead of praying, we don't pray. We worry. We, 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 we toss things in our minds. You know, how we put this one here and put that one there. Instead of simply praying. Imagine uh, Peter on the on the on the on the river, sinking, and maybe trying to get a boat, trying to swim, trying to do what? No, what did he do? He prayed, "Lord, save me." And if we pray, make prayer the first port of call. We save ourselves a lot of headaches. <laughs> Instead of planning and preparing and, and fighting and, you know, spinning out our minds, pray. And when we, we, we make that um, part of our lives, life becomes a bit easy, right? <laughs> when you pray about everything, in our house, bringing up the children, we prayed about everything. We are sending you to go and buy onions, we pray with you. You come back, sometimes we forget, but sometimes we remember. If you're going to school, we pray with you. You come back, we pray. That is going to work, we pray. We sit behind our seat, we pray. Up to now, even though the children are grown and taking their own decisions, they still come back for prayer. They still want to solicit prayer from everybody else when they're taking, especially when they're taking major decisions. Oh, hey, I'm doing this. When we are traveling, you get to the boarding gate, you you ask, you, you put a notice, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. So throughout the time, somebody is praying for you. It's made life a bit easy. Because if I didn't have a God, I would be praying to. I don't know what would have happened to me. Life is a lot more easy when we pray. I'm telling you. <laughs> I remember on a recent trip, I didn't have a card to pick. You know, in America, you have to um, pay for the trolley. So I was at the airport and I didn't have a card. I didn't even have dollars on me. You know, I have other currencies. And I needed a card to put my, my luggage on. So I approached this guy, you know, uh, and and somehow, I don't know whether, what happened. You know, this guy just came around and said, no problem. I, I will, I will help you. <laughs> I will help you. And he did. In addition to helping me, I also had the opportunity of witnessing to him. It was so amazing. I also had the opportunity of witnessing to him. You know, prayer makes life 
exciting. Because in prayer, you get to know what to do and what not to do. So David said, for to you do I pray. We've talked about the objects of worship or to whom we should pray. But we are talking about the prayer itself. And I'm challenging you. Before you talk to anybody about whatever issue, talk to God first. I tell the children, before you come to us for school fees, talk to God. You come to us for uh, sanitary towels, talk to God. You talk, come to us for pocket money, talk to God. Because if he doesn't provide for us, you, we will not be able to help you. And I think it's working this far. Even the grandchildren are picking it. They want to pray. And let me tell you something very funny that happened recently. You know, whenever maybe a child falls down, you know, the first thing we do is to we pick that child and pray, Lord, please take the pain from that, you know, uh, person, you know, amen. So one of my grandchildren gave the senior one a knock, gave him a knock. I mean, it was unprovoked. Gave him a knock. You know, this is three-year-old, gave the five-year-old a knock. And then when she started crying, he put the hand on the head where he had not. He said, Lord, please take away the pain. <laughs> Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I pray. I loved and loved and loved. You intentionally gave him a knock. And the next thing is to pray for him so that the pain will go. I'm just sharing this with you that we, we, we make it a habit and we pass it on to the children. Their lives will be better. And of course, the big brother stopped crying <laughs> after the prayer. <laughs> I mean, the way he spontaneously did it, I, that was the last thing I was expecting him to do. But he did it. I'll give you a look. You are in pain. Let me pray for you. He will pray. Will you pray about everything now? Now, what is the time? It will be a rush going through this, but perhaps if the Lord gives us permission to come this time, we'll look at it again. The time of prayer, it says, I will pray in the morning. And we use this when we are teaching on quiet time. Why do you want to have your quiet time in the night? So see, yeah, it's only the night that I can... Really? You are amazing. Why do we need to have it in the morning? Because in the morning, you, you, you are... You are fresh. You are lively. You, are, you have a composed frame. And you want to use, you prepare that as a sacrifice to offer to the Lord. All right? So David says, in the morning, in his praying voice shall be heard in the morning. The cry or the voice of my cry will be heard in the morning. And then shall my prayer be directed to you. I'm going to call on you. So it's like God wakes up in the morning and tunes in the radio, you know, to channel David because he knows in the morning David will be calling. Hey. We have all the amazing excuses why we should not have our devotion in the morning. You know, I'm in a hurry and I have to do hey, So how do you manage? Because if I don't have my quiet time in the morning, it's like the whole day I'm disorganized. And when the Lord allows you to have your quiet time in the morning, gives you grace to have your quiet, the whole day is so well aligned. So well aligned. This is when you can finish praying and say, Lord, oh, I booked this appointment and it's just like, there's a clash. I don't know what to do. So can you do something about it? And he, he organizes, he tells that person, don't come now. And, and the Lord orders it. When this one is leaving, the first one that is now coming. Orders everybody. By your dictates on your list. If you don't want this, what do you want? It is away the frustration because uh, now we have to command the morning. You know, uh, it's not that you are commanding the elements to obey you as it were. Even that we, we have because the elements obey Joshua. We have the authority and control. Look, when Psalm 8 is talking about the authority God has given to man, do you understand it? Do you understand it? I remember years ago, the Lord said, wake up in the morning, take authority over your home. Take authority. I didn't even understand what was going on, but a lot was going on. Take authority. 
So taking authority simply means removing every other authority and asking that the kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we're all doing this in our neighborhoods, a lot of crimes will not be heard of. A lot of situations will die out by themselves because we are in charge. God gave us dominion, authority. And these are the tools we should be deploying early in the morning. You, midnight, when the witches uh, are meeting in their covens and, and declaring things and planning things, you are sleeping. And then you wake up in the morning and you will not even shut down what they destroy what because it says whatever we we we, we allow, you know, uh, on earth will be allowed in heaven, whatever we stop on earth. You don't believe that. At you touching anything here on earth will be done for them in heaven. Whatever we bind here on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever we lose here on earth is lo- you don't believe that. Hey, what do you believe? So we take authority. It is in the morning. I don't mind if we should end on this. It is in the morning. Please, in the morning, ask the Lord to wake you up a wee bit earlier than your own scheduled time. And he would. He would tell him, Lord, I want to wake up at 1 o'clock. You will be sleeping at 12.59 and he will wake you up at 12.59, uh, you know, before 1. He will wake you up. Because you need to stretch and turn before one o'clock. He will wake you up. Because he is God who is on time. So the psalmist is saying, it's not like the morning is the end of it. No. Because in Psalm um, 55 verse 17, he says, Morning and evening and at noon will I pray. So the morning is just not the end of the story. Okay, go and ask Daniel. The same way. The morning is not just the end. But in the morning when he's fresh, that is when he prepares the sacrifice. And it has not ended. I will wait and listen to you. How you want the day to run. Okay. And the composed frame, you have got clear of the slumbers of the night. You are revived by them and, and not yet filled with the business of the day. We have then most of our prayer considering the dangers and temptations of the day to which we are exposed. And against which we are concerned by faith and prayer to fetch in fresh supplies of grace. I'll pray in the morning. Time is up. And I don't want us to rush through this. Four tools of effective communication with God. I pray. I pray. Instead of worrying, I pray. I talk to God. He is the object of my prayer. He's the one to whom I'm directing my prayer. And then I do that in the morning. In the morning before I step out, he's in charge of the day. And I'm looking at his word because his word is a light onto my path and a lamp, you know, onto my uh, light for my uh, path and a light onto my feet. Light for our path, lamp for our feet. So I can see the details. And I can also see the general stuff that I need to. I pray that the Lord will give us grace. <laughs> we miss so much, right? We miss so much when we don't we are not intentional about prayer. Amen. If you don't know Jesus. Um, he hears the prayer of the, of, the, of, the, of the unrighteous because he made the wind, the air, the rain fall, blow for the sinner and the righteous alike. But when it comes to the crunch, God knows his own. <laughs> so don't, don't make a mess out of that. When it comes to the crunch, God knows his own. So if you haven't given your life to Christ, the best prayer you can pray for God to hear to you is a prayer for forgiveness of sins and a prayer of declaring His Lordship over your life. That you receive His eternal salvation, eternal life, beginning here, so you can die in peace because you have a destination with Him. 
that is not just the purpose. You will live a life that has a link to your maker. You will not be just a mere creature, but a child of the Most High God. Don't pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for letting me know that sinners cannot start in judgment, cannot stand in judgment before you. I'm a sinner. I've sinned against myself. I've sinned against you, God. I've sinned against my neighbors. I ask you to please forgive me. Wash me with the blood of Jesus. I declare that Jesus is Lord. He died for me and God raised him from the dead. Dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and my personal Savior. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, please write the names of those loved ones who are saying this prayer today in your book, the Lamb's Book of Life. Fill them with your spirit and enable them to walk with you in righteousness and holiness all the days of their lives until we see you face to face. Amen. Dearly beloved, this is the end of our story today. It's a good story, right? The story of a consecrated man and prayer. The Lord wants to hear you. He wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to walk with you. Give him the chance. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you once again for your covering the blood. The wall of fire around us, angels with their flaming swords. Thank you for making us know your ways. So we walk in a path of righteousness for your great name's sake. We give you praise and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and keep you till he brings us to the third again. Amen. Amen.